welcome to Grace Community Church's virtual service. We're so glad that you could join us in this season of celebration and hope. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. We hope this message finds you well. Please feel free to sing loud and worship, and I hope the Word gives you what you need to get through the day. Thank you again, and welcome. Today is Communion Sunday, so please make sure that you go and get your emblems so we can take the bread and the wine together. And Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We want to be humbled in gratitude, not just grateful when things are good. We want to have the gratitude that brings us to our knees because you've done so much for us. You gave us your Son, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We're so grateful for this church and the opportunity to listen to the word and to worship. Just be with us, Father, as your will unfolds in our life, and we thank you again in his name. Amen. What child is this? the 
Son of Mary So bring him incense, gold and myrrh Come peasant king to own him The king of kings salvation brings Let loving hearts and Please join me as I pray for the offering, and I want to encourage you about this. Thank you, uh, our treasurer and the book, the word of uh, the board of elders. The word I'm still in the word. The board of elders um, are astounded at the fact that we have exceeded our budget, and it doesn't mean that you should stop giving and sharing. You should because we, hopefully, in our church, use all that is given to do everything that we can to help people, to touch people, to reach people, including supporting this ministry of recording and producing and uh, putting out this. Um, this isn't live. We, pro we produce this and we edit it where I, I make all kinds of mistakes and hopefully Brent, who does all the editing, he has to listen to this more than one time. So he's really, really Christian now. <laughs> anyway, he has to go through all this process to put it out there and Occasionally, there are still mistakes because nobody does anything perfect. And uh, it costs a little bit of money to do all of that. And then there's just the regular ongoing uh, support of the church and the salaries and the, and the people that we uh, have for staff and the missionaries whom we support. And you're going to hear from one, one of them in uh, this sermon series in December. So thank you. And we're going to pray that the Lord would bless you and that the Lord would actually uh, increase your prosperity like he did for the Egyptian, um, the Israelites in Egypt. When God was judging Egypt, he prospered the Jewish people in Goshen. So that's my prayer for you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your people who support the gospel ministry uh, that Grace Community Church hopefully represents and will continue to do so. It is hard to find churches, as I've been told many times. I wish I had a church like this where I'm from. Um, Lord, we need to see that more and more across the land, around the world. Churches where people can come and find you and know you and experience you. That's all we're trying to do. Take what is given and multiply it as you did with the fishes and the loaves. And also, Lord, bless the hands and the hearts and the attitudes of the givers. Prosper them. Give them health. Give them confidence. Give them joy. In Jesus' name, amen. I have traveled many moonless nights, cold and weary, with a
If a wiser one should have had my place, but I offer all I am to the mercy of your plan. Help me be strong. Good morning. I'd like to invite you to the first Sunday of December, second Sunday of Advent for those who follow a liturgical calendar. And we're going to look at the Gospel of John today. And in the Gospel of John, um, I've done this before. I've preached a message about Christmas in the Gospel of John, which is an interesting thing because most commentators, when they write about the Gospel of John, uh, highlight the fact that John does not talk about the birth of Christ or Joseph, a little bit about Mary later on in other uh, incidents, but uh, it's inferred in the Gospel of John. And I want you to see how you can see the planning of God concerning Christmas. And it's inferred here by John, who is tackling a theological issue about who Christ is, what he is. Is he a man? Is he more than a man? He speaks of his deity in the first passage of the Gospel of John. Um, if you remember, I decided to use 1 John as a springboard to help us to focus in on this particular message. So let's pray and ask the Lord to give us insight as we go through this message. And hopefully it's encouraging to you and um, hopefully you can Take another step in your growth and your relationship with the Lord Jesus. Thank you, by the way, for praying for me and for uh, encouraging me by emails and texts about uh, recovering from the coronavirus uh, that I contracted. It really did knock me for a loop. I'm a lot better. Uh, I feel like I'm getting closer and closer to normal, but I'm surprised that it has taken about more than a month to get to that place. So let's just pray as we are living in these days that seem to be so strange. Lord, we thank you that we can look to the Word of God, which never changes. Everything around us changes even our lives, our health, uh, our situation, our, our family life, our careers. Everything changes, it seems. So we need the constancy of the, of the Scriptures to give us a sense of permanency. And that can only come from you since you are really the only permanent being that we know of. We pray that you'll help us, Lord, to trust in you and to have the insights from the Holy Spirit that you would have us to have concerning the Word of God, for it is your Word. It's not the Word of any man. I may preach something from the Word of God that is insightful, but that's only because your Word is so profound and it is eternal. Therefore, no one can ever plumb the depths of it all. So help us as we look at one of the most beautiful passages in the whole Bible, a passage which identifies your person, who you are, where, were you, where you were before you were born, and what you did. Help us, Lord, to, to understand what John the Apostle wants the body of Christ to understand at the behest of the Holy Spirit who inspired him to 
write down these words for the people of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Christmas is in the Gospel of John, and in this passage, he talks about beholding the glory of the Lord. And it's an amazing statement because it's in contrast to Moses, who could not really behold the glory of the Lord. And in the Gospel of John, at the end of the Gospel, just about it says in chapter 20 that he wrote all of this down so that you, so that I, so that individual people can come to a belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. So with that said, let's take out your sermon notes and please follow along as we um, go forward here. Now God speaks of Christmas in the Bible from eternity. We as human beings look at Christmas as a celebration of the birth of Christ and there's certain um, features that are usually included in that. And, and um, when you look at the Bible, however, and the mind of God, who would have understood from the get-go before anything was created that he would have to do something about the fall of man, about man's fall into sin. And he already anticipated that and planned for it since before anything was ever made. Uh, because God is eternal and he understands all outcome. So when you read the passage here in the Gospel of John, what you're looking into in a way is the very mind of God, because God was planning this since eternity. In the beginning was the Word. This is the first opening statement in the Gospel of John, and in Greek it's logos. The word, word is in Greek the word logos. Beginning is arche, where we... Uh, we get other uh, compound words from it that speak of prototypes or the beginnings of things. In the beginning is a direct relationship to Genesis 1, where John is obviously writing to both Jewish minds and helping the Gentiles, who have now many of them begun to respond to the one true God uh, who is revealed in the Bible. He's uh, taking us back to Genesis 1 where there is a supposition that John has that many Christians have already begun to read and understand many of the, the, um, the concepts that are contained in the Bible. And in Genesis, God is featured as being there already. In the beginning was God. Um, he's using that phrase in the Gospel of John because the identity of Christ was being attacked already by rabbis and by... Uh, naysayers and by heretics who were basically accusing Christians of believing in more than one God. And so he's going to set things straight here because the revelation of the Trinity is something that was not known before. It was not completely a developed theological understanding that there's one God in three persons, the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son. This is something that was new in the understanding of the revelation of God to people. So, uh, especially the Jewish people had tremendous problem with this. And he, John, remember, he's a Jewish believer in Christ. And he is a Jewish believer and writer of scripture is going to help us to understand the nature of this uh, Trinity being, this being called God who has revealed himself to us in the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. So. This beginning is taking everyone back to the beginning of the Bible. So the comparison is obvious. In the beginning was the Word. If you knew Genesis, in the beginning was God. So he's going to go this direction. He's going to go in the direction of identifying this, if you will, concept called Lagos, Word, the Word. And Arche and Lagos is a... Uh, a statement that when I was reading one commentator, he said that some individual in the time of Augustine was a rebellious young Christian uh, raised up in a Christian family and was kind of uh, throwing it off and making fun of his mom and dad about it. But then one day he read these words and these words froze him for a whole day. And it they just made him understand something that he hadn't hitherto considered. And that's when much of the, the, the her heretical issue of was Jesus created or was he not was being discussed in theological circles and then finally settled by the creeds and the, 
the councils of the church. Uh, you have to come to an understanding of who this word is, because if you don't, you won't be saved. Uh, you won't understand who Jesus is. If he's just a created being, if you are, have been pulled into that thinking, or as many atheists and agnostics, when they look at Jesus, they look at what they call the historical Jesus. You'll see this come out at times on Easter and on Christmas. And uh, who was Jesus? Say these so-called experts who don't believe in the Bible anymore and don't believe in the deity of Christ and don't believe the cardinal doctrines of the church. And uh, you need to be careful because if you get sucked into the thought that Jesus was just a religious leader, a, a good man, a nice guy, did some cool stuff, but he's just another man, then you're never going to understand who he is. That's what John is, if you will, putting out there for the, the believers and even non-believers to look at. So in the next part of the, in the next part of the passage, Christmas originated in the Trinity. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, nor is the word rapture, but they are concepts that are there in the Bible. They're taught in other ways. The Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's even found in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God and the Spirit of God hovered over the deep, and God said, God spoke. So there's the Word of God, which we know later on in the New Testament that the Word of God is identified as Jesus Christ. So the Trinity is featured all over in the scriptures. It's just that it was an undeveloped understanding in, in the minds of rabbis and biblical scholars until Christ came and the apostles were given revelation directly by Jesus Christ to understand more important uh, concepts or surrounding this. So the word, of the word, the logos, was with God. Kai, logos, and protheos is the Greek. I'm not a Greek guy, okay? I just took my Greek tools and my Bible study tools on my computer, and I just put them right under the text right there so that you can see. Um, this concept of the word was with God, okay? So he's talking in the beginning, so let's not lose sight of the whole passage. In the beginning, God was there, as Genesis teaches and as John is featuring. In the beginning, God was there. And in the beginning, John is saying the Word was there. And the Word was with God. And that, in English, we use the word with, and it, it, it doesn't convey, I was listening to MacArthur on this one, and he said, it doesn't convey the concept well, because it means that before everything was, God, the Father, and the Logos were in a face-to-face -face relational uh, situation. It wasn't like, here's God and here's the word over here. It was, it's meant to be looked at as when you looked at before everything was, what was there? Well, there wasn't a what, there was who, who was there? There was God. And this God is revealed here in the Gospel of John as a being in his own person. There is a, a plurality is the word that I'm looking for. And this plurality is a is featured as a fellowship, a face-to-face -face relationship. So I remember my wife was reading something in a, a children's Sunday school class that was being offered, and she asked me about it because it said something really funny. It says, God was lonely. <laughs> so he, he decided to create us. God wasn't lonely. God had a perfect relationship in the Trinity that was 100% contentment. There was no need, actually, for any other being to be in existence. Uh, we live in linear time, so it's difficult for us to even grasp this whole idea. But in eternity before there was anything created, even angels, in the spiritual realms or in the physical realms, God was not lonely. God was content in his own being. And that being was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in a perfect relationship, a relationship of fellowship that is featured in 1 John called koine, koinonia, which the apostles say, John says, we the apostles are in fellowship with the fellowship that God has in the Father and the Son. And we're invited into this fellowship, okay? We're invited into this fellowship, a relationship with God, not a religious prescription about how to follow God or listen to God, but simply an invitation. And when you listen to Jesus in the Gospels, what you're actually hearing is this invitation, come, 
Come, come and see. Come and see what I'm like. Come see who I am. Check me out. It says in the Old Testament, come and taste that the Lord is good. Come and taste. There's always an invitation. Come into relationship with me. So the, the word was with God in a perfect relationship before all things were created, before the angels were created, before the universe physically was created. God existed. Now, because our finite minds can't grasp the notion of eternity, even though it's interesting that even pagan cultures like the Greeks came, came up with the concept infinity. They understood that there's something called infinity. There's something that is not measurable, timeless. It goes on and on, on into the past, on into the future. And so this is God. Um, you and I in our linear time frame, and because we're temporal creatures, we live our lives in a direction. We go forward in a direction in time. God doesn't. God calls himself the first, the last, the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega. He calls himself these, if you will, he's the master and the overlord of all time and all history. So he already knows the end of the story because God in his person is already there because there is no time that governs the being of God. He's already in eternity future, a concept that is so difficult that it's hard to teach. So let's go to the next. So Christmas originated in the Trinity. Um, God himself speaks of, and I use that word speak in John 1.1, 1, 1, the word, the logos, he spoke of uh, the coming of the solution to sin and the fall of man and the decay of the corruption of, of evil in the world and in, in creation. God already anticipated all of this and spoke of it since before anything ever happened because obviously in the counsels of God before everything came into being by his power, by his creative power, he, God, uh, understood what would need to be done. So Christmas would have already been conceived, if you will. I don't even know if it would be conceived. It's in the mind of the eternal God. Uh, he understood what to do before he ever acted. So in 1 John, remember I told you I would use this as a springboard into the Gospel of John to launch the whole series on the messages about quote-unquote Christmas. Um, I want to get more profound and deep about this whole thing and not just say, oh, how nice it was, the wise men and, the, and Mary and Joseph and the angel. I want to talk more about the concepts of you and, and me and individual people coming into an understanding of who God is because that's what John features. Watch, in 1 John 1, 1 to 3, we've already gone through this in the past couple of sermons that I've done. That which we have seen, remember when he says, remember when he says we, he means the apostles. And I've tried to emphasize to you in the messages recently that the apostles, if you're around me and you listen to Bible studies that I lead, the apostles are a special group of human beings that Jesus personally chose. And there are no more apostles. I think I showed you that in Acts chapter 1, in order to replace Judas, the requirement was this individual that replaces him, said Peter and the rest of the apostles, has to have been with us since the baptism of John, the baptism of John, the ministry of John the Baptist, until the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. And so uh, they, they chose, they put forward two people and they drew lots and it fell to, the, to a man named Matthias. So uh, I actually heard somebody say that that was a mistake. They should have waited because Jesus chose P, uh, Paul later. Th that's not correct. Uh, Paul didn't replace Judas in the 12. Paul was a special appointment by Jesus personally to take the message of the gospel to the non-Jewish world. Um, so he wasn't a replacement. He was a special appointment, if you will, Paul. But anyway, coming back to the we, we the apostles have seen and heard and declare we unto you that you also may have what we have, fellowship, with us. We have fellowship. Uh, when I was first teaching this, one of the individuals in one of the Bible studies thought that this meant we can have fellowship with the apostles uh, because they're human and we can have fellowship with them. And that's not what he's saying here. He is basically, if you continue, uh, truly our, we the apostles, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So this word koinonia, koine, or whatever 
however it's exactly pronounced, there's different forms of it in Greek, it is a relational uh, word. It is this same thing that's being revealed to us in John 1, 1 and in John 1, 2, that he was with God in the beginning. The word was with God. And this fellowship is what we're being invited into. We're being invited into a relational uh, situation with God through Jesus Christ who gave to the apostles the foundational teachings for how this comes about, okay? So it's really important that you get this because you can have what the apostles had. They met him and they came into a relationship with him. And if you know from the old covenant that they couldn't do that, they come, couldn't come into personal relationship with God. Uh, Moses uh, couldn't even see God. Um, Enoch walked in an, in an a intimate fashion with God to the point where he was actually taken, but that was before the Mosaic Covenant, and that was before the flood, um, showing us, I think, historically that it is possible to develop a relationship with God that is intimate, powerful, and dynamic. It is possible. You can have this. You can have fellowship with God. You don't need, it is not prescribed or maintained by some church or by some list of do's and don'ts. It is simple invitation into relationship with the Lord. And when you come into this relationship, you start realizing, wow, I have what the apostles had. I met Jesus Christ. Now, you didn't see him physically. You didn't behold him like they say. And you didn't get personally taught by him. But you do get that in a different form because he says to the apostles in the upper room, I need to go. For I must send to you the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, and he, and Jesus uses a different personal pronoun for him. He doesn't say me in spirit form, he, although it is him in spirit form. He features the Holy Spirit as another person in the Trinity. He will come to you. I will come to you. My Father will come to you, and we will sup with you. So the Holy Spirit gives to any believer what the apostles had while he was here on earth, a relationship with the Lord. You can have it. I can have it. You don't have to wait around and have some kind of a uh, religious experience from it. You simply have to seek for it and ask the Lord for it, and he'll give it to you. Kind of like when John and... Um, Andrew first met Jesus. They were disciples of John the Baptist. And John said, there's the Christ, there's the Christ. So they went and they said, hey, where are you staying, Rabbi? And he says, come and see, come and check it out. Come and see what it's like to meet me, to live with me, to have fellowship with me. That's all God's doing with us. Now, Christmas is not an event. Uh, we are, <laughs> even in liturgical church calendars, Christmas is on the calendar. Okay, we're in the, Advent season, and this is Christmas time. It is not an event. Just like I say, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and relationship to Him is not a religion. It is a relational thing. Christmas is a person. Just like I've said before in other sermons, that love is a person. Life is a person. And that person is the Lord. Christmas is in a person. That's what it's all about, okay? The Word was God. This statement is so um, definite in Greek. And I'm not a Greek scholar, but I remember listening to various Bible teachers over the years that I've been under in seminary and in Bible college that this is um, undisputable in its structure in Greek, in its grammatical structure in Greek. There have been groups that have attacked this concept that the word was in one so-called translation, and it's not a translation, it's somebody's personal interpretation. They put in this, and the word was a little G-O-D. So Christmas is in a person. Christmas is actually a person. Obviously, it's the birth of Christ. We know that. It's not an event. It is a person. And when you understand that it's something, he is someone with whom you must deal with. You will understand that it's not just an event that's on the calendar. It's a relationship that happens daily. Christmas doesn't just happen once a year. Christmas, in a way, for the Christian is occurring forever, forever now. In eternity, we'll all be there because he became us. He became human. The word was God, okay? The logos, kai logos, and theos is the Greek sentence here. 
there is no way that you can put a little G-O-D, because the word theos in Greek means God, capital G-O-D. In, in the context of the whole teaching here, he's not ever using a minor G-O-D, little G-O-D concept. He always uses the word theos concerning the description of God. So those who have been uh, deceived by the groups that have said that this is something else, you need to listen to some of the individuals who are experts in Greek on this. Uh, one guy actually wrote a whole treatise on this. One guy that was a Greek scholar at UCLA wasn't even a theological professor, and he said he used this as an example of people butchering Greek, that you cannot do this with the structure of the Greek here. It means logos was theos. Lagos was theos. This logos, the word that was in the beginning, the word that was with God in, in perfect fellowship, this word became, I mean, this word is none other than God. So he's trying to make it very, very clear, not trying to. He did make it very, very clear at the behest of the Holy Spirit so that the church wouldn't be confused about this because the, the debate at the beginning of church history was, what was Jesus? Was he an angel? Was he a created being? Was he lower than God? Was he higher than the angels or equal to the angels? Was he some kind of special human being? What was he? John is settling this for us. God is the Word, and the Word is God. And as we go on forward, you'll see that the Word is Jesus. Christmas was premeditated. I tried to infer this earlier about the fact that in the counsels of God, in the mind and the thought processes or, or uh, of God. It's not, when I think of God, I don't think of a being who, who has to think because he is aware of everything and there is nothing that he does not know. So his, uh, he, we have to think and reason things through. God doesn't. This is so foreign to us. We can't even think of a being like this who is, has this capacity to know all things, understand all things, and proceed forward because of the knowledge of all things. Now, when I say premeditated, that is to say before he created all things, God understood what had to be done. The same, the word, the word, the same here in, in the next verse was in the beginning with God. Just to make sure, he reiterates it. He was with God, he said earlier in John 1.1, 1, 1, and he wants to make, us, make sure that we understand that he's still talking about the same uh, being, the Word, who is God, was, this Word was in the beginning, going back to Genesis 1, with God. Okay? Again, featuring this relational thing that we need to be aware of as individual Christians. Instead of a list of rules and uh, religious prescriptions that usually most churches and denominations lay down, got to do this, this, and this, and this, in order for... Really, the first thing you ought to do is ask the Lord into your life and ask Him to help you to understand Him more and to grow in your relationship with Him. Not, what do I do? That's what they asked Jesus. What do I do? What do we do? What does He want us to do? And Jesus said, believe in me. Believe in the one He has sent. Have a faith and a trust in the Lord and let that faith and trust uh, take off and take root and grow in you so that your relationship with the Lord will be more and more dynamic and have influence in your life and people around you. Somebody this morning was talking to me and explaining to me all of the confusion in his family and people being resistant to the gospel and people not listening. And I go, don't stress on all of those things. You simply grow in the Lord, become stronger and stronger in the Lord, and the consequence of that will be a blessing for your family, your marriage, your friendships, your co-workers. It will bring fruit. It's just don't stress so much about whether somebody uh, responds in our minds rightly to it. Just continue to be strong in the Lord and it has an influence on people around you. In 1 Corinthians, Paul the Apostle instructs the Corinthian church that if a non-believer is married to a believer, that the believer should not seek to leave that non-believer because the believer's presence as a believer brings the Spirit of God into that household and there's a positive influence over that household because of the presence of one believer. So regardless of the situation that you are in, whatever relational situation God has allowed you to be in, 
a marriage that is be with a believer or not, or, or a family that is uh, antagonistic to Christianity, don't worry. Simply grow in this relationship with the Lord, okay? Now, so all I'm trying to do in this message is to show you something. Christmas is about a person, and when you get to know this person, you will have a relationship that would be, will be, will be so uh, astonishing that as you grow and grow and grow in it, like remember when we were first John, I think it was last week, where John says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. He uses the same phrase here in, in the gospel of, of, of John, in the beginning. When you come to know him, you come to know a person, not a God dictator dictatorial God who is there and you're here, but a, a being who has freely invited you and I into a dynamic relationship with himself. Yes, he's God. He's higher than us. He's separate than us. He is worshipful. Angels fall in front of him. All of that, yes. However, still, he is inviting us into intimacy with himself. That's phenomenal. It's, it's beyond description. Christmas is actually the best gift of all because Christmas is simply the invitation of you and I to come and to see. Remember, the, the shepherds come and see. Let's go and see. Uh, let's go check this out. What's going on here? God is showing himself as a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. The baby born at Christmas is none other than God who became human. It is stupendous. It is, and, and unfortunately, some of the spin-offs of that have been, okay, let's worship his mom. And nowhere in the scriptures does the Bible ever encourage us to worship a created being. And Mary was certainly a created being. Yes, the mother of the, of the humanity, if you will, the, the boy of the baby Jesus Christ, but not the mother of God. It was in order to be the mother of God, you would have had to have been in existence before God and give birth to God. It just doesn't make sense here, okay? And that's for my Catholic friends and my Catholic uh, family members and Catholics in general. The teaching of the Roman church or even some of the other Orthodox churches, maybe the Russian Orthodox, that where the worship of Mary began to happen pretty quickly, I was astonished myself how quickly that developed. I don't know why that came up or how. I just know that the real Mary of the Bible would have never, ever let anyone fall in front of her and worship her. I know that because when you read about her in the scriptures, she loved God. She understood who God was. She understood the Bible. And anytime you read about any individual in the Bible like that, like the apostles when they did a miracle and somebody fell in front of them and tried to sacrifice to them, they immediately said, no, no, not us. We're just men. I know that Mary would say that. So this teaching that Mary should be worshipped, revered, yes, she should be honored and honored in the sense that, yes, all nations will call me, all people will call me blessed, yes, but it doesn't mean that that prescribes some kind of a blessed Virgin Mary prayer. It, where that came from and why that is featured so uh, strongly in so many denominations, I don't get because it is very anti-biblical. And you need to read the Bible to see that God reserves worship and prayer only to himself. We are only to pray to him, not to the Apostle Paul, who has already been gone many, many years, or Mary, or Peter, or John, or Moses, or Abraham. They would have never accepted that. They would have never said, pray to me. They wouldn't have accepted it. The Jewish people were... They had an aversion to this. This is why they struggled so much with the person of Jesus Christ being uh, divine. The Jewish rab rabbis had a huge problem with this because in the mindset of the Jewish people, only God is God. Okay, But the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ as being God made flesh w was just phenomenal. It still is. In him was life. Life is a concept that isn't just a concept. Life is dynamic. Life is abundant and full and it's all around us. There's plant life, fish life, bird life, animal life, trees, humans, angels. God has life. He need to just have it. The Bible says he is the life. He's life. In him is life. It doesn't, it shouldn't actually say was life. He's simply saying, look, when we met him, what we met was life. This is what we met. 
life personified. When you read in the book of Revelation, you read that the throne of God is there in the new heavens and the new earth. And from the throne proceeds in, in metaphor form for us to try to conceive of it, I guess, a river, clear, clear as crystal river. And it said it is the river of life and it comes from the throne and from the throne of the Lamb. One throne, God the Father and the, and the Lamb, the Son, and from that life comes, from them, from them, not from the throne, from them, from God. God is the author and the, the, the giver, the sustainer of what we call life. And many people who don't even believe in God don't understand that their very existence is owed to this being called God. This being gives even the non-believer who shakes their fist at his face. I don't believe in you. I don't believe that you exist. I exist by myself. I came into existence all by myself. Evolution brought me here, not you. They can think that all day long, but that life and that even ability to think is coming from the very being that they say doesn't exist. Life comes from God. And that's why that the invitation is not a debate issue. It's an invitation issue. We, do, we can't argue or, or debate with you the point of God until we're blue in the face and think that we can win the debate. We can only do what the apostles and, if you will, even Jesus and God is doing. Invite you to come and see this life. Come and experience this life. Check it out. Somebody dropped off a box of Bibles to us. Their mom or grandma died, I guess. And she must have been some kind of a really devout believer in Christ because all of her Bibles are all underlined and everything. And I thought to myself that it was sad because if somebody that I loved in my family died and had a box full of Bibles, I would keep those Bibles. Just even just for history's sake, I would keep them because there's some of her notes in the margins. So there's some, some of her thoughts contained there. I just don't understand why generations that were raised with heritage that is Christian, even biblical Christian, unless you had some really negative experience with a church uh, episode and some people just throw the church and they're all out with the bathwater. Don't blame Jesus and God and the Bible for the failings of man-made structures or man-made behaviors because men always fail. Men always, uh, they're not God. They, they don't have uh, sinless uh, existence and they're going to make mistakes and they're going to say wrong things. Even I, I try to say this from the pulpit often is that I'm a preacher, but I understand that I'm human. And because I'm human, I don't teach with inerrancy. I cannot teach with inerrancy. I am not infallible as they try to say the Pope is, for example. And I've actually met some Christian Bible teachers who think they're infallible in all points. And that's a real dangerous position to take because all of us have fallibility. We don't know everything. No teacher understands and can teach the Bible as if they have it all down pat. Nobody does. And I've listened to some really good Bible teachers. And some of them are so good that they sometimes come across like they know it all. And you've got to be careful with that because nobody does. Only God knows everything. And him was life. Life was the light of men. Light shines in the darkness, this light, and the darkness comprehends it not. Light is essential. We're living, in the, in the, we're living on uh, the winter side of, in the northern hemisphere right now, and the earth is tilted away from the sun, so we have long nights and short days, right? You need light. We have all kinds of lights. We have LED lights nowadays that are really bright. We have halogen lights. We have, uh, we've had a way to make light since the days of fire because we need to see in the dark, right? We understand the concept. That's why the concept is in the scriptures. Light, darkness. So this light is obviously more than just physical light because light's always been around. The light we're talking about here is the light that comes from God or if you will, just like I said, he is life, he is love, um, he is light. It isn't that he has light, he is light. Truth, spiritual truth comes only from God. There is no other place that you can go to to find true spiritual truth. Problem is there's so many people that jump on, okay, let me write this book about this so that you can understand it better. It's better to just come to the person 
the, go directly to the one who is the giver of life, who is the source of light and life and truth. Go straight to him. Listen to him. Read the Bible yourself. Yeah, there's plenty of great scholars and great Bible teachers, but ultimately you need to take the time to get into the word yourself and get this habit going in your life where you're sustaining your understanding of God. God is teaching you the way you learn. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would lead you into truth. So just listen and listen to the Bible. People are always giving me books. I don't have time to read all of these other books. I don't. I barely have time to read the Bible as much as I should. And it's, it's just a strange thing that there's so many other things that come to distract us to get us almost away from reading the words of the Bible do that. You'll never regret it. Anyone that I've ever known in my life, when they start doing this, they never regret it. Read the Bible. And the darkness comprehends it not. The darkness being talked about here is the darkness that mankind sits in. Uh, one of the prophecies of Christmas is that the people sitting in darkness saw a great light. And this is the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ, the word that was made flesh. The darkness of man is profound. Our darkness is a confusion that all philosophers, teachers, religious leadership, and, and uh, human-made structures haven't been able to solve. What is this darkness all around us? Why is there so much evil and so much uh, crime and hatred and killing? And where is this coming from? It is in, it's the darkness we sit in. I love to listen to Sherlock Holmes and audiobooks. And there was this one terrible crime that had happened that even he, and he's a mythical creature, uh, character, by the way, and <clears throat> he, he was dumbfounded by the evil that was perpetrated in this particular case. He just felt really, where is this? What is this? Where does this come from? And of course, he wasn't a particular believer in the Lord, unfortunately. As many people, as they get smarter and smarter, they get colder and colder towards God, it seems to me. Christmas is meant to be shared. You need to share Christmas with people. That's the whole, you come, you find him, you see him, you touch him, you behold him, you see his glory. It's meant to be shared, and that's precisely what has happened. That's how Christianity has always spread. Somebody meets the Lord, and they in turn go around and tell others, guess what? I met him. And then everybody's like, oh no, another one, a holy roller, whatever they, you know, uh, call you. It doesn't matter. You meet him, you get excited about him, you start telling others about him. Some are going to respond positively. Many are not. Many are not going to respond positively. Don't let that deter you from being a sharer of what you have found. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. The same came for a witness. John came to be a witness. What's a witness? Somebody who saw something. To bear witness of what? The light. That through him, through this man, John, people might believe. Or it could be inferred that through this, through him, the light, people might believe. So we are here to tell people about him who gives life and light. We don't point to ourselves. We must not point, come to me, come to my church, come to my religion. And you're going to really, no, come to him. Come to the one who can give you light, like the thief on the cross, I'm going to die. I need you to remember me. Okay, tonight you'll be with me. That's all we're trying to do. There's a story in the Old Testament of these Jewish men who were, who were starving to death because they were besieged. Um, their city was besieged, and they were all starving. And one night God sends an angel and creates this confusion, and all of the army that's besieging them flees away. And so these guys that were kind of like beggars, they happened upon, they said, well, let's just go outside if we get killed or well, because we're dying anyway. So they went outside and they were going to go beg for food from the army, right? And instead they found everything empty in their camp and there was all kinds of bread and food and they were eating and they're like, wait a minute, this is wrong. Everybody in the city is starving. We need to go in there and tell them that we found something to eat. So they did. So the, what, the reason I brought that up is this. All we Christians are is this. We found somebody named Jesus Christ who forgave us of all of our stupid sins. And we want you to know. That's all. We don't think we know everything. We don't think we have all the answers. We know that he does. And all we're telling you is, guess what? We know where you can eat. 
and it's the best restaurant in town. It's the best restaurant in eternity. And you ought to come and check it out because the food is really, really good here. You're starving. You need him. Christmas is meant to be shared. It's meant for you to share. Just like the shepherds after they saw him. Let's go tell everybody what we saw. Christmas emphasizes him, not us. People get upset about Christmas. Uh, somebody called me after Thanksgiving. I'm really upset. I go, why? Well, no one invited me for Thanksgiving. I go, why didn't you invite people? <laughs> why didn't you just invite people over? You know, it's kind of strange. The proverb says this. If a man wants to have friends, what is, what's the next part of the verse? Anyone think about it? He must show himself friendly. If you're a lonely person and nobody wants to get near you, maybe you need to let down your quills, okay? Let some people get close to you. Yeah, but they'll hurt me. You got to come out of the shell. You got to come out and you've got to show yourself and you got to reach out to people. It's okay. Yeah, you're going to get hurt feelings. Yeah, you're going to get your toes stepped on when you go to the dance. So what? At least you danced. Christmas emphasizes him, not us. He was not that light. Him, John the Apostle, John the Baptist. He wasn't the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that comes into the world. John the Baptist is featured in the Gospels, all four of them, as a prophet whom the Jewish people responded to in mass. They all went out to him. They all listened to him, even the, the detractors. Who are you? They came out to him. They were really excited God had sent a prophet. John is known for this, especially in the Gospel of John. He must become greater. I must become less. He wasn't upset when John and Andrew went to follow Jesus. We emphasize him. We don't emphasize ourselves. I am not the answer to your sins. I can't do anything about your failures. I know that he can, though. I can teach you. And all I'm doing is pointing, pointing, point. That's really all I do. Point to him. All I'm telling you is I don't know all the answers, but I know he does. I visited a lady who's supposed to be dying yesterday. And that's all I told her. I said, look, I don't know why at 28 years, 38 years old, you are paraplegic and you appear to be dying. I don't know why. I know that it looks like you want to live. And she said, yeah. And I'm just afraid, she goes. And I go, you don't have to be afraid of him. And I give her that verse, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I said, how would you like to get to that place? She goes, I would like that. And I said, it's not that you won't feel nervous about dying or you won't feel a little bit of trepidation. You will, because it's an unknown experience. Everybody's going to feel that. But you don't have to be afraid of him because, like it says in that psalm, he is with me. He will walk with me through the valley of the shadow of death. Christmas emphasizes him, not us. Let's remember that. It's about Him. Christianity is not about you or your church or your interpretation or your own experience. It's about Him. When you point people to Him, you're doing the right thing. Don't point them to yourself or to your favorite teacher or your favorite book. Point them to the Lord. Christmas is rejected by worldly folk. He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. That is still truth for today. We live in a world full of people. Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. I take that to infer that the planet was full when the flood came. And there's a lot of people alive now. And many, many, many people do not have any concept of the Lord because of various uh, human structures like governments and persecution. But many, many people have willingly rejected the Lord. And that is all over the planet because the main belief about where we humans came from is called evolution. And there's many iterations of that belief system. And evolution teaches that we came into existence without God. We exist without Him. We don't need Him. He made this world. He created this universe. He created life. He sustains life. He gives blessing. He gives rain. He gives snow. He gives all health. He gives you health to your bones. I'm glad that I came back to health. I was sick. I'm actually glad I experienced sickness because I rarely do because it made me more able to relate to people who are sick. Um, 
The same thing with death. I'm glad death has happened to me in my life because it's made me able to be more effective in teaching and encouraging people when they experience death. We're living in a world full of God rejecting people, folk I say here, because from kindergarten to graduate school, we are taught and the culture uh, emphasizes this all over the place, science, uh, that there is no God, that this is all God and the concepts of God. That's religious, that's on this side, that's cool if you want it, but it's not really factual, it's superstitious. So this is science, this is what we really believe. And what we really believe is this, God didn't have anything to do. There is no God, first of all. And if there is, that God has nothing to do with us being here. He was in the world. This is a... It's really an indictment. It's not a, an instruction. It's an indictment. And it's a, a statement about the condition of the darkness of people. He was in the world that he himself made. He made this world. And they didn't know him. They don't know him. The, the, the world of mankind in its many cultures and languages and through history and time, they all come up with new and different ways to deny him. To, to pretend he does not exist. And that's unfortunate because Christmas, and it's almost like that Grinch cartoon thing and the Grinch movie that they made out of it. It's true. They stole Christmas from everybody. They stole it, but we really need it. We need to know the light and the revelation of the person who became human, the Lord who was in the manger, humbly born, just to show us what it really means to come to... Uh, the power of God. It's not power, it's humility. It's amazing. Christmas is family-centric. <laughs> Unfortunately, in our culture, when Christmas happens, a lot of real negative family things occur. There's fights, there's arguments, there's like, you, it's just strange how we look at things. It's a family-centric thing. Watch this. He came to his own. He came to the Jewish people. He was Jewish. He came to them and his own received him not. Well, that's the one, this one and another statement that Jesus made actually caused me to think that I shouldn't come back to New Mexico because I'm from here. I grew up with the people here. I have family here. And he said that a prophet is not without honor. I have had tremendous honor being a Christian, being a teacher. I've had tremendous honor in serving the Lord, but he said, but he's not without honor except amongst his own people and amongst his own family. You might be Billy Graham, okay? And you have family members that don't want to listen to you. It's interesting, don't you think? Jesus, and by the way, that's something that Jesus experienced constantly. Not only did the Jewish people not accept him and the world that he created and the people in it didn't accept him, but um, his own family didn't accept him. As many as received him, to them he gives power to become sons of God, even them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood. That is, it's not a genetic thing, it's not a DNA thing, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I like this invitation because it means a lot of things. It means a lot. You don't have to be of royal blood to be in his royalty. It's interesting, they would have wars over this when they were trying to replace some king. Is he in the line or is he not in the line? Is she in the line? It doesn't matter here. It doesn't matter which line, quote unquote, you are in. Your family might be a total loser line, a bunch of thieves and liars and prisoners and who knows what else. But that doesn't mean that you can't come to know the Lord. You can. It doesn't matter where you came from or your family came from. You can be the individual that changes the destiny and the future of your family line. It's family-centric. You really need to understand God is inviting us into his family, and he's showing us this. All you have to do is respond. If you receive him, he'll give you this power. What's this power about? Is it power that I'll be able to walk on water and heal people at a, at a word? No, the power is much more powerful than that. There's something that we have that's more powerful. It's to become his child. It's to be in his family. That is really, really powerful, man. John the Apostle in 1 John later goes and says this, Behold what manner of love the Father has given us, that we should be called his family, that we should be called the children of God. That is powerful. 
I don't need to resurrect people from the dead. I don't need to walk on the water. But to be included in God's family, to me, that's really exciting. I come from a large family. Love getting together with large family. When you get together with the family of God, Hebrews says, you have come to a mountain, not of fire, but of joyous assembly of all of the elect angels of all time, of all of the elect from all time, and the church of the firstborn. We're going to be in a family that'll never end and in a family reunion that'll never say goodbye. You were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. We now live in a time where culture and parents, I don't want this kid, I'm going to go kill it. Or yes, somebody, oh, I don't want you to have that kid, go over there and have an abortion. And it's a strange time that we live in in that sense, because historically in humanity, people looked at children as a blessing to the future. When a culture starts to look at their progeny, their babies, their future generations, is something that is disposable, that culture will cease to exist. Historically, it's been shown everywhere. It's happening in the so-called developed countries all over. I read an article recently that the developed countries in Europe are, are kind of uh, competing to get immigrants to come in because there's not enough of the national people to replace the old and dying. That's happening to America as well, unfortunately. And that's because we have looked at having children and babies as something really, really wrong. And that's why I was actually glad that I was born Catholic because <laughs> I was born Catholic, okay? I was born in the Catholic Church through my Catholic family. And when I was born, there were still a lot of women and men who believed that you shouldn't have birth control and you shouldn't uh, stop what was a natural thing. So my mom and dad had 10 children. I'm one of 10. I'm the fourth of 10 children. Two um the first one's still living, the oldest. The, the second one, my sister Sylvia died of cancer. She became a believer. Uh, the third one died when he was born. He died after one day. And then I was born. So I'm glad because in, in the dominant uh, American culture, oh, 2.1 kids, that's all I want. The rest of those, you know, I'll take the pill or I'll just go to the abortion clinic. I'm glad that my mom uh, still felt that no, uh, this is natural. We need to continue this. We need to see things uh, rightly from God. Christmas is God's glory, grace, and truth. What is Christmas? I've already shared with you that it's a person, the person of God who became flesh. We, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John is sharing. He's a human being who met Jesus. And when he met Jesus... As all of us, we don't realize at first who we're meeting. They, in their meeting Jesus, thought Jewish thoughts about what the Messiah should be. They, they actually came to a pretty early confession of you are the Messiah. But they didn't understand the very nature of his person and his being. Once they were in a stormy sea and they were about to sink and they were seasoned fishermen and they, they cried out and shook Jesus awake. We're going to drown, we're going to drown. And he calms the sea. And it's really funny. This is another one of those Bible classes I was in where the guy knew Greek pretty well. And he goes, in the Greek, it says they were afraid of the storm. But when they saw Jesus calm the storm, they were terrified of him. When you come to know Jesus, it's like, who is this guy? Because that's what they ask. Who is this? We thought we were just following, you know, somebody like Moses or Elijah or one of those. Who is this? He, he says to a storm, stop. And he's like, Stops glass, glass surface. Who is this? When you follow him, you're going to find him to be the most compassionate, loving, forgiving being you'll ever know. But you'll also come to find out that he's the most powerful, worshipful uh, being that there is. Angels fall in front of him freely and of their own will fall in front of him and call him God. And so should you and so should I. He dwelt amongst us this word that was God, this word that was light. He dwelt amongst us. That's the glory of Christmas. In the old covenant, you couldn't even get close to him. In the new covenant, he came and became one of us. And that's who we met. And we beheld his glory. Moses couldn't. Moses gets told by this God, you can't even get close to me. I'll let you look at the backside of my glory when I cover this little cave with my hand, but you can't get close to me. John is saying, 
Not only did we get to get close to him and touch him and behold, we got to see his glory. And his glory was that he became human. That was the glory. And that is stupendous. The glory of the only begotten of the Father. Begotten, not made, says the confession. Begotten, not made. Full of grace. Grace as uh, juxtaposed against law and truth. Law is truth, but grace is more powerful than law. The letter, letter of the law kills, but grace forgives. Grace redeems. Grace restores. That's the truth of God. No matter what dumb thing you have done in your life or where your life and your choices have taken you. That's what I shared with this woman last night who freely admitted to me that she was in the position she was in because of her past decisions. It doesn't matter. God will take you and he will bring, like the thief on the cross, tonight you'll be with me in paradise. Whoa, that was easy. <laughs> it wasn't easy. For us, a lot of us, it's hitting our head on the wall a million times when we find, like that guy, he's getting nailed to a cross and finally he says, I'm sorry. You don't need to get nailed to a cross to say, I'm sorry. You don't have to become Mary Magdalene and get seven demons in you to say, I'm sorry. Or the man in the, in the cemetery who had thousand demons in him and say, I'm sorry. You can say it now. You can ask, and even if you're a really nice person, never did anything really, really bad, guess what? You still need them. Because the Bible reveals that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you need them as much as the sinner who has a thousand demons in him. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, so much for the revelation of Christmas in the Gospel of John. Because it is profound. It is beyond just a baby more, born in a manger. It's beyond that. It's that you would reveal yourself as human, a glory that could be beheld. It can be beheld. You can be beheld. You will never not be Jesus in the flesh. Yes, glorified flesh now, but you will always have your human body forever in future, in eternity. And we will always be able to behold you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Christmas, because Christmas is the very mind of God to bring us back into relationship with you. I pray that somehow this message might encourage somebody, anybody, to turn their hearts to you. And for those who already know you and serve you and love you, may it encourage them, help them to grow. Amen. Today is the first Sunday of the month. On the first Sunday of the month at Grace Church, we observe communion together. Um, this is not a, I never want this to, to develop into just a rote practice that we do because, oh, the Bible says we've got to do it, so let's just do it. It's also profound because Jesus said something about this that's really profound. In the Gospel of Luke, he says, I will not eat of the fruit, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until the kingdom of God is fulfilled. I take that to mean that he has, if, if you will, if you know anything about the Nazarite vow, he's waiting for the final communion celebration of all of the redeemed of all time, where we'll all sit down and have that communion that Jesus will finally sit down with us. I think, I can't prove that one, but I just have that thought in my heart. And I, knowing the Lord Jesus, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, so as we take communion, remember this. He took bread on the night he was betrayed. He broke it and he gave it to the disciples. Now, this was nothing new. They did this every year for Passover, okay? The leader of the Shabbat meal did this, passed around the, the bread and the bitter herbs and everything that represented the lamb who was slain and the blood was put on the doorposts of the household so that the angel of death passed over them. Obviously, the initiation of um, the Passover into the church is that Jesus is the Lamb of God and that He allows Himself to be sacrificed and broken for us and that when we all participate in that meal, if you will, then we, uh, the, when the wrath of God comes, it passes over you because the wrath of God is coming against a world of evil and a God-rejecting, God-hating world that doesn't want to acknowledge Him. That's coming. But you and I are protected. We're protected by the blood of the Lamb. 
And that's a really neat thing to know. And by his sacrifice on the cross where his body was broken for us, and in the brokenness of his body, he has healed us. The body of Christ was born, and that body is continuing to grow and become more and more uh, diverse and strong and amazing. So let's celebrate communion together. Let's eat. And let's drink together. And let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your broken body and your shed blood, which cannot ever be reduplicated by any church ceremony. I came from a church that thinks that this is something that they reenact every every day, and that it has equal power to what you did on the cross. Well, that's a dream. You died once and for all. We cannot duplicate it. And we're not just doing this for drama's sake. We're doing this to remember you, to refocus our hearts and our minds on what it took to bring us, all of us, sinners, individual sinners, into the proper relationship with our God. And we thank you for it. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of the service today at Grace Community Church. If you like this video, please hit like and subscribe. Share it with your family and friends. And we can't wait to see you again next Sunday. Thank you.